the Rosine Charter. Uh, thank you, Alas Khan Corley. I very much welcome the opportunity to speak on this bill. And I speak as a TD who doesn't label myself as either pro-life or pro-choice. And I strongly disagree with attempts to pigeonhole people into one or either camp. For too long, I believe the debate on abortion has been polarized and we've not heard sufficiently from the middle ground. I believe most Irish people like me are very much turned off by the extremes of the pro-choice and pro-life lobbies. Abortion is much more complicated than some of the public debate would indicate. In my view, it is about finding the correct balance between two sets of rights, that of the woman and that of the unborn. To see the issue as merely a matter of choice for a woman is to deny human rights for the unborn. At the same time, to insist on an equality of rights between the woman and the unborn is simply unrealistic. I believe that the majority of Irish people have a very nuanced position on abortion. They certainly do not want abortion on demand, but nor do they want us to pretend that in life very real and serious dilemmas do not arise for people. I believe a majority of people want a sympathetic but robust system, a sympathetic and robust system that would rule out abortion on demand but would allow for abortion in a number of specific situations, such as, for example, where the woman's life is at risk, in the case of fet a fatal fetal abnormality, or in the case of rape and incest. I think we need to ask the question, what would I do if I was in any of those situations? Or what would I do if my wife, or my daughter, or my sister was in any of those situations? Ideally, in those situations, decisions on termination should be made by the woman concerned on the advice of her medical pro professionals. But unfortunately, as we know, these si situations were not provided for in this country under the original 1983 amendment. This bill, I believe, is a minimalist response to the ABC judgment designed to meet the basic requirements of that ruling and indeed the political needs of both government parties. I welcome the fact that the bill clarifies the situation where there is a real and substantial risk to the life of a pregnant woman arising from a physical illness that can only be averted by a termination. This provision in Section 7 is essential for the protection of women and it provides clarity and certainty for medical practitioners. Two medical specialists must certify this risk, which need not be immediate or inevitable. In the case of an emergency situation relating to a physical illness, certification for the procedure may be issued under Section 8 by one medical practitioner, and this, I believe, is reasonable. Provision under Section 9 relates to the risk to a pregnant woman from suicide, and this is one of the main sections which has given cause for concern. A requirement to legislate in such cases arises from the X case judgment in 1992 and the subsequent referenda in 1992 and 2002. On both occasions, the people voted not to remove suicide as a ground for legal termination. In spite of these decisions, no legislation has been produced until now. The January and May hearings of the Health Committee provided an opportunity for people to tease out the full implications and consider all of the difficulties involved in legislating for termination in these circumstances. The evidence provided and the views expressed by the medical and legal witnesses were not conclusive. There was conflicting evidence and advice. It is important to point out that if suicide was excluded from this legislation, the constitutional right would still exist. However, there remains genuine concern that the inclusion of suicidal ideation as a ground for termination would result in a significant rise in the rate of terminations. The evidence would seem to suggest that the number of women who become suicidal in pregnancy is extremely low. 
in the case of women at risk of suicide due to an underlying psychiatric condition, termination is rarely viewed as a treatment to avert this risk. But what about a situation where a woman presents as suicidal because of her pregnancy? Even where three medical practitioners certify that there is a real and substantial risk to her life, the concern remains that this could, in time, result in a significant increase in the number of terminations on this ground. One of the problems is that we have no way of knowing whether this will happen or not. I want to say that I believe that this bill is a genuine attempt to prevent this happening and that there is no deliberate intention to allow for a liberal abortion regime. However, we cannot be oblivious to the experience of other jurisdictions in this regard. The concern is that medical specialists will be put in an almost impossible situation. From a starting position of do no harm, doctors will be faced with the situation of having a duty to save both lives without adequate legal protection. What about a psychiatrist who, in good faith, deems a woman seeking a termination under Section 9 not to be suicidal? How will he or she be protected from prosecution or sanction should the person, for whatever reason, later commit suicide? Couldn't the absence of a legal protection for the psychiatrist under this scenario lead to a default position where no medical practitioner feels able to deny a request under Section 9. It is because of this that there needs to be a thorough annual review mechanism for the legislation in order that we can be assured that it is not having unintended consequences. It has been suggested that a sunset clause should be included and this would seem like a reasonable safeguard in my view. The bill as it stands is flawed and needs considerable strengthening in this regard. I want to say that I have also serious concerns about the absence of any gestational limits for terminations under Section 9. I believe most people would find this unacceptable. The bill unusually distinguishes between the termination of a pregnancy and the ending of the life of the unborn. As a result of there being no, no gestational limit, doctors will find themselves with a very serious ethical dilemma. Under this legislation, we would have the extraordinary scenario where a woman may be granted a termination on the grounds of suicide and her child can be born unwanted, possibly with multiple disabilities arising from its early delivery. There is nothing in this bill that I can see which sets out the rights of that child or how the state will provide for such a child. In the interests of balancing the mother's rights and the child's rights, I strongly believe that gestational time limits should apply in Section 9. It is not acceptable to provide for a scenario which many people would find abhorrent and which I believe will put doctors in conflict with their ethical demands and indeed their medical guidelines. It is not sufficient in my view to claim that there are constitutional obstacles to setting time limits. If it cannot be done here, then there should be a clear commitment to hold a referendum on it with other referenda in October and before this legislation is commenced. Both of these key issues were raised at the committee hearings, but as far as I could see, they were not satisfactorily addressed. During the committee hearings, there were also strong points made by many health professionals about inadequate resourcing of our maternity and psychiatric services. The picture drawn was of a system which is very close to being dangerous. Pressures arising from the implementation of this legislation will undoubtedly put patients at further risk, and this is an issue which requires the Minister for Health's urgent attention. In my view, it is a matter of regret that this bill does not currently cater for fatal fe fetal abnormality. I understand that several hundred couples every year face the harrowing situation 
where the baby that they're expecting is diagnosed as being incapable of survival outside the womb. We have all heard the heartbreaking stories of women who have been faced with this awful diagnosis. These are babies who are very much wanted, but who cannot survive once born. I think most people would view it as callous and indeed wrong that early delivery cannot be carried out in Ireland in these circumstances. It is a scandal that such couples must travel to the UK for this treatment and return home heartbroken to await the ashes of their baby to be sent on at a later date. I would strongly urge the Minister to amend the definition of the unborn in the Bill in order to cover babies who are incapable of survival outside of the womb. In my view, and I believe the view of many Irish people, a person who becomes pregnant as a result of rape or incest should be able to have a termination in an Irish hospital. It is inhuman, in my view, to expect a person in those circumstances to proceed with the pregnancy. Again, we should ask ourselves, what would I do if I or a family member were in that situation? It is worth noting that if termination were available in the case of rape, we would not have an ex case judgment. The bill provides for the making of regulations by the minister. This is a standard provision. However, it does not identify the sections under which it is intended to make such regulations, and that's very unusual. Clarity is required on this point, and in addition, I believe it would be essential that all of the proposed regulations would be published in full at an early date in order that they can be considered in conjunction with the provisions of this bill. On the matter of a free vote, I would have to ask, what are the government parties afraid of? This is undoubtedly an issue of conscience, and for that reason, party members should be allowed to follow their consciences. Free votes are commonplace in the UK Parliament and in other jurisdictions, and there is no reason why they should not be a feature of our Parliament also. In conclusion, then, I would strongly urge the Minister for Health to accept members' amendments or to bring forward his own um, to substantially strengthen this bill. As it stands, it is not acceptable. An annual review of the operation of the legislation is required so that its impacts, impact is closely monitored. A sunset clause would address many concerns. I would also strongly urge the Minister to ensure that gestational time limits are provided for under Section 9. Consideration must urgently be given to providing for fatal fetal abnormality. Overall, it is impossible to see how this most complex of issues can be dealt with adequately and in a way which reflects public opinion without revisiting the constitutional provision. Anything else is likely to be an Irish solution to an Irish problem, which does not, in fact, provide a solution at all. Thank you.